This is Anthony Morganti. Welcome to my podcast for the joy of photography. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning to this week's episode of the podcast. Today, I'd like to talk about the photographer Gary Winogrand. Over the weekend, I had the opportunity to watch the new documentary that is out on Winogrand. It's called Gary Winogrand, All Things Are Photographable. Now, those of you not familiar with Winogrand, he's an American photographer. He was born in the Bronx. He died relatively young. He was 56 when he passed away of gallbladder cancer. Uh, he started out as an editorial photographer, and they even mention in the film, he wasn't really a top-tier editorial photographer, but he didn't really enjoy that type of work. But he did enjoy street photography, and he really didn't like the term street photographer. He used to just refer to himself as a photographer. I go out and take pictures. That's what he says. But Nonetheless, uh, he was a street photographer, and he went out and took a lot of images. And he gained notoriety um, in the 60s because uh, a guy named John Zarkowski, he became the curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art. And he was the curator of photography for a long time there, from 1962 to 1991. And Zarkowski liked Winogrand's work and featured his photography uh, in exhibitions at the museum. And that was a huge break for Winogrand. And I mentioned before that um, a lot of times to be, a quote, a famous photographer, it's luck. Uh, a lot of people might argue that Gary Winogrand's work is no better than somebody. You could just find some somebody, some random person on the internet. It's not any better than this person on the internet but no one ever heard of that person on the internet. Well, sometimes you just have to get lucky. And, and really, quite frankly, Winogrand probably got lucky by having this John Zarkowski really like his work and give him an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. And, you know, I'll talk about more. I do like Gary Winogrand's work a lot, and I'll talk more about specifically about his work. As far as the documentary is concerned, I want to talk about maybe three things about the documentary. Overall, I did like the documentary. If I was forced to give it a, a star rating, um, Rotten Tomatoes type thing or something, I'd probably give it three and a half out of five stars and take that for what it's worth. I'm obviously not a film critic. Um, it was good. Um, they basically showed his work, talked about him as a human being. They Mainly the whole thing is interviews with contemporaries, friends and um his first wife uh they talked about talked to her a lot now he's married three times and they actually do have audio of his i think his second wife i think it was but anyway the film overall you know i think treated him in a in a good way um talked about his shortcomings his um things that he was really good at and there was a lot of audio of him speaking a little bit of video of him and, of course, they showed a lot of his images. So, overall, the film was, is good. Um, but I'll qualify it to say that if you're looking for a film that's going to be more technically oriented, meaning they're going to talk about um, f-stops and shutter speeds and stuff like that, uh, this isn't the film for you. They don't even mention any technical aspects of photography at all, outside of maybe framing a little bit they talk about framing and mainly they give you an idea of who Gary Winogrand was as a person and what he was as a photographer and one of his influences was speaking of framing was Robert Frank and Robert Frank if I'm not mistaken I could be wrong in this was a, a Swiss photographer who came to the United States uh, achieved a Guggenheim, Guggenheim grant to photograph uh, America and he traveled from coast to coast photographing Americans. And of course, Robert Frank came out with the very famous book, probably maybe the most famous street photography book there is called The Americans. And 
Gary Winogrand really liked Robert Frank's work. And one thing he took, he took away from Robert Frank's work is that it, you didn't have to be technically perfect. You could have a crooked frame. You could have an autofocus subject. It really, maybe, if you had a crooked frame and had an out-of-focus out of subject, would add drama to the scene. So Gary Winogrand, if you're, again, looking for a technically perfect photographer, and if you feel that technically perfect means it's got to be perfectly level, perfectly focused, always have the perfect shutter speed, perfect aperture, he's not like that. It's more of the emotion in the moment that he's capturing. And... There's a lot of um, famous images they show, and one relatively famous image, image they show is a shot in Beverly Hills of um, there's three young girls walking towards the camera. The sun is behind them. They're in the bright sunlight, and they're dressed very well, and to the side of them in the shadows is a handicapped person in a wheelchair with a cup begging for money. And the juxtaposition of those two subjects um, make the image. But what also makes the image is that the girls are in light and the handicapped person's in the shadows. And also the frame is tilted. It's, it's very crooked. And I think that adds to the drama of the image. Also in the frame to the right is an um, immigrant child. It looks like a Chinese uh, child with a, maybe a grandma with them and some other people sitting on a bench. So it uh, kind of adds in balance to the frame. So that's one of his more famous images, but it is an image that technically isn't perfect. So if you're looking for a photographer that is technically perfect, Gary Winogrand probably isn't that guy. But overall, I think you'll understand where he's coming from, and the film will help you um, understand where he's coming from as a photographer, trying to capture that moment and that emotion and that gesture that is inherent in a person in the frame that um, makes you wonder and makes you think. Now, one thing I want to talk about that they mention in the film is that they said in the film that he was the first street photographer uh, with notoriety to shoot wide angle. He used a 28 millimeter lens on his full frame, like a camera, a full frame. It was a film camera, okay, 35 millimeter film camera. So he was the first street photographer to shoot wide. And if you read any article or any book on street photography, you're told that you should shoot with a wide angle lens. Don't use a zoom lens. Don't use a telephoto lens. Don't even go to 50 millimeters. You've got to be like, like 28 or wider even. And use your legs to zoom in. Get close to your subject. Walk close. You hear that all the time. Now, there's a couple advantages to shooting wide. First of all, you get a better feel of what the street is because you're getting a wide angle view of the street. Uh, second of all, it's a lot easier to use a wide angle lens. You have a lot more inherent depth of field at any aperture with a wide angle lens. And generally speaking, if you're using a wide angle prime lens over, let's say, a zoom lens, it's going to focus quicker. So you're going to focus faster and you're going to probably capture more decent shots because of that. Now, my issue with the wide angle lens is that everyone is doing it. Everyone reads these articles and reads these, um, these street photography, how to books, and they're out there shooting with wide angle lenses and everything is starting to look alike. What you have to keep in mind, Gary Winogrand's work stood apart because he was the first photographer of note to use a wide angle lens in the street. Before him, they mainly were using a 50 millimeter lens on a full um, or a film camera. I keep saying full frame, but that's wrong, of course, a film camera. So he was different. 
his images looked different than uh, somebody else's because he was using a wide angle lens. So if someone's, I haven't heard anyone say this, but if one, some, someone says, well, the famous photographer Gary Winogrand used a wide angle lens, you should use a wide angle lens. Well, not necessarily, in my opinion. Your goal as a photographer is not to look, have your photos look like Gary Winogrand's photos. If your name is Ellen Smith, your photos should look like Ellen Smith's photos. So what I'm trying to say is you should uh, try to be you, whatever is true to you. If you're out there with a wide angle lens trying to imitate the style of Gary Winogrand because he used a wide angle lens on a film camera, then in my opinion, that work is fraudulent. It's not really you necessarily. Maybe it is. No, I should you know, qualify it. Maybe you are the type of photographer that likes that wide angle of you. You like that. So you should go out and do it. But I think what people may miss about Gary Winogrand, and they mention it in the movie, and I'm going to say it again, he was the first photographer of note to use a wide angle lens. And I think that's important to make that distinction. Now, everyone's using a wide angle lens. And I mentioned there are advantages to it. But I strongly believe that the next street photographer of note is not probably going to be using a wide angle lens. They're probably going to be using like a 500 millimeter lens or something crazy like that. Something that sounds totally absurd. But that will make their work look unique and look different than everyone else's. So that's one thing I took away from the documentary about how, and I, you know, I, obviously I've been on this for a while, that you shouldn't always listen to the masses and shoot a wide-angle lens because everyone else is shooting a wide-angle lens. You should shoot what works for you. Now, if you're just starting out in street photography, again, um, it is an advantage to shoot that wide-angle lens. It's easier to frame, it's easier to focus, and you get more depth of field, and you'll probably uh, create more keepers with the wide-angle lens. But once you start getting more astute at using your camera, you might want to use a zoom lens, and you could frame the image or the scene that best complements that scene. Um, that way it might work better for you. I don't know. It's something that you're going to have to experiment with. But that's one thing I took away from the, the uh, documentary. Another thing I took away from the documentary is that, and I, a lot of people know this about Winogrand, when he died, there were thousands of images he didn't either process, a uh, film that he didn't process, or film he processed, but he didn't print contact sheets. Now, those of you that aren't familiar with film... Typically, what you would do is you would process the roll of film and you'd have a bunch of negatives. Then you'd take those negatives and you'd print a contact sheet, which is really just the negative printed as a positive on a piece of photographic paper. And it's the images on the photographic paper are no bigger than the negative itself. But it allows you to go through your images and usually you would have like a magic marker and you would X out the ones you don't like and you would circle the ones you like, and then the ones you like, you would print. And basically, that's how we culled our images when we shot film. So he had tons of developed roles that weren't printed to contact sheets, and then he did have a, t a lot of contact sheets that he didn't um, go through at all, so they weren't culled. Now, estimates were that I've heard crazy things. In the, in the movie, one person says that he had 250,000 uh, images that were either on rolls of film that weren't developed, uh, rolls that were developed but not contact sheet printed, or contact sheets that weren't going through. Someone else in the film said he had 347,000. Either way, he had a lot of images he didn't really look at. In the film, they talk about how later in his life, now his most prolific period and probably his most famous period was 1964 when he shot in New York City. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, in 1964, right after he left New York City and he was uh, shooting in Austin, Texas, 
and Los Angeles, California. And these, this is like his most famous work. But later on in the 70s and 80s, when he moved, he first moved to Chicago, then he moved to Austin, then he moved to Los Angeles. And he started just taking pictures and not looking at the images anymore. Um, after he died, that uh, curator of photography from the Museum of Modern Art, John Sarkowski, wanted to do a retrospective on his work. So he got two contemporaries and friends of Winogrand to go through all his film, develop it, process it, um, uh, print it, and come out with some what was good. Well, Zarkowski came to the conclusion and said that Gary Winogrand later in his career lost it. He was, his exact words were, he's no longer great. Now, whether or not that's true or not, I mean, that's Zarkowski's opinion and it's subjective. But what I get from it is we need that feedback loop. We need to take a picture and hopefully within a day or two, we could look at that image on our computer screen nowadays and decide whether it's any good. And if it's not good, what did we do wrong? What could we do to improve? If it is good, what did we do right? What or what is it that makes me think it's good? Why does that image connect to me? So uh, it helps go towards you developing and nourishing your own personal photographic style. Gary Winogrand, because he wasn't bothering looking at his images anymore, he was just out there snapping the shutter, he wasn't really a full photographer anymore. He was only a part photographer. He was a shutter snapper. So he didn't get that feedback loop anymore. So that's important. You really have to look at your images after you take them with a critical eye. As fun as it may be to go out and take pictures and be in the moment, uh, capturing the scene, uh, getting in that decisive moment. It's still a very important part of the process. You need to go and look at your images. It's important to get that feedback loop working, and it will help you improve as a photographer. If you don't do it, you may digress as a photographer, as some people argue happened to Gary Winogrand. Now, the other thing that I take away from this, and I, you know, mentioned is that he took so many images overall. If you um, figured out a conservative estimate of the actual images that he has taken that were printed, images he took that he printed contact sheets on but didn't print, images that he took and developed but didn't print contact sheets, and rolls of film he has that he never developed. If you estimate that over his photographic career, he'll come out that he took two to three rolls of film every day. He shot two to three rolls of film every single day of his professional life. That is a lot of photography. That is a lot. And that's the main thing that I took away from it is you really have to get out and shoot a lot. And I don't get out and shoot enough. Particularly in the wintertime, I don't like cold, so I tend to not to go out. But there's a lot of things I could take photographs of that I could do in my studio or in my house, and I don't take advantage of it. Uh, I think it's important, especially if you're a street photographer, you should shoot a lot. I mentioned in my book, Mastering Street Photography, that if you look at any of the great or the so-called great street photographers, uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, Vivian Meyer, Joel Meyerowitz, you could go on and on, name a street photographer, and you look into their work, you'll find that they took hundreds of thousands of images in their career. Hundreds of thousands. I'm not talking even tens of thousands. They took hundreds of thousands. In the case of Gary Winogrand, some estimates were he took over a million. I saw somebody did an estimate that he took over 5 million. I think that might be a little high, but he, but it's probably somewhere more in the middle. But he took millions of images. And if you look at which images of Gary Winogrand's are uh, of any note, you'll probably see the same 100 or so images. 
And you could say that about any photographer. Go go to the bookstore if there's one left in your your city. Go to the bookstore and look at Vivian Meyer and you'll probably find two or three books on Vivian Meyer. And I guarantee you're going to see the same 30 or 40 images in all those books. Um, Joel Meyerowitz, you'll see um, maybe more for Joel because he had a lot of different themes he shot at, uh, shot for. So you'll see more for him, but still for the hundreds of thousands of images he took, you're not going to see even maybe a thousand. Um, so especially street photography, uh, the decisive moment is, is fleeting and very difficult to capture. And whether or not you believe in the decisive moment is another thing. But my point is you have to go out and take a lot of shots. And that's something I'm going to work on. Another thing I want to work on, and they do talk about it in the documentary, is a lot of times when he took a picture of a small group of people or even a large group of people, the people were looking just off the frame. So they're not looking at him. They're looking just off the frame at something that is interesting. And that really does make for a very compelling image because you're going to look at that image and you're going to wonder, what are those people looking at? What is it they see? And it adds mystery uh, to the shot. So I think that is something that I'd like to work on. Uh, quite often, I notice in my work, the, um, I'm not very stealthy when I'm out taking pictures. And people will notice me. And I have a lot of images of people looking right at me when I'm taking the picture. So I'd like to work on this um, this other aspect that I think will add a lot of intrigue uh, to uh, my shots, some drama, is people looking just off the camera, wondering what is that, what's over there? Because I think that would help a lot. So overall, I think uh, the movie's good. Um, now I bought the movie on Amazon Prime. It was 10 bucks. Is it worth the 10 bucks? Uh, well, if you're like hardcore photographer like me, yeah. But if you're just, you know, casual, Wait till you could watch it for free on HBO or something, you know. Um, but overall, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was interesting. And um, again, I didn't talk about, like, they, they go into his personal life. He was married three times and, and things like that. But overall, I thought it was good. And they, re they seemed to represent him in a very fair way. They didn't just talk about him like he was a saint but they didn't talk about him like he was the devil either. They talked to him, he was a human, and they and I think they handled it. Um, they handled it really, really well. So uh, that's my take on Gary Winogrand and the documentary. Again, it was called Gary Winogrand, All Things Are Photographable. Um, that's it. Uh, in the show notes, you'll find uh, links to a couple different websites that I uh, flashed on the computer here for those of you that are watching the video thank you for watching my podcast for the joy of photography remember stop by my website onlinephotographytraining.com there you'll find all my latest videos and articles to help you improve your photography that's it for now i'll talk to you guys soon